sponsored by Skillshare. Blackberry. I mean, the real Canadian Atoms and Bits Blackberry died years ago. This week, though, the Chinese Bits and American Atoms that briefly reanimated it finally gave up the ghost as well. As a Canadian, I was heartbroken then, and I still am now. Instead of awake, instead of pouring one out though, I wanna take this opportunity to look back at what happened to the once industry leader, the Titan, and more importantly, why. Apple found unprecedented mainstream success with the iPod. A thousand songs in our pockets was just the beginning, but Steve Jobs never made the mistake of confusing Apple's products for its business, and he knew the iPod was just a product. It was the smash hit of its time, to be sure, but time is relentless. Something was coming for the iPod, something that was more than just a product, a convergence. The phone combined with the mobile internet, and yes, with MP3 players, it was an existential threat. So Jobs turned Apple towards the iPhone, and at that moment, at that very moment, BlackBerry was ended. We just didn't know it yet. I'm Rene Ritchie, and this is Vector. When Steve Jobs announced the iPhone, BlackBerry's co-CEOs just couldn't believe it. Not in the way you or I or most people couldn't believe it, how slick the new operating system and its multi-touch gestures looked, but literally couldn't believe it, as in they thought it wasn't real. At all. The iPhone didn't evolve from the iPod. It inherited iTunes connectivity from the iPod, but it didn't evolve from it. Apple considered making an iPod phone, even had the head of iPod working on a phone as a hedge. But instead, the iPhone evolved from OS X and a secret multi-touch tablet project codenamed Purple. It may have started off as a way to cannibalize the iPod before anybody else could, but it ended up being a way to put real apps and the real web in our pockets and in the palms of our hands. RIM, as BlackBerry was known back then, evolved from the pager. It was meant to be a way for people to get their email on the road. Eventually, it added a keyboard, PIN, and BlackBerry Messenger, a proxy browser that would do almost anything to save on data, and J2ME apps. It became the mobile communicator everyone who was in business or wanted to be simply had to have. So looking at the iPhone with no physical keyboard, a display so big it just had to absolutely thrash battery life, a full-on web browser that would no doubt wreak havoc on data networks, and with nothing like BBM, the hook that put the crack in Crackberry, they thought it had to be fake or simply massively ill-conceived. But it turned out BlackBerry was selling keyboards to people who were increasingly thirsting for full screen content. They were selling it to IT departments instead of humans and enterprises poised to go, BYOD, bring your own device. They were selling internet accelerators in a world rapidly moving from the equivalent of dial-up to broadband. And they were selling BBM to people who ultimately decided switching chat apps was just less painful than doing without everything else. Verizon hard passed on the iPhone, and why wouldn't Verizon? It was Verizon, and they weren't about to let Steve Jobs dictate terms to them, much less support a device Apple wouldn't even let them see until launch. Singular, about to rebrand as the new AT&T, was in a far more precarious position and willing, or just desperate enough to take exactly that kind of risk. Now, we can all make jokes about the early years of the iPhone on AT&T and how the load was so far beyond the network capabilities that many people, many times, couldn't even use their phones as phones. Having that many customers on the iPhone was a real problem for AT&T, but it was an even bigger problem for every carrier not named AT&T. And that was especially true for Verizon, which wasn't just losing customers to the iPhone and AT&T, but the best customers, the ones who were willing to buy the most expensive phones and pay for the most expensive plans. Churn, baby, churn. So Verizon went to BlackBerry and demanded an answer to the iPhone and fast. BlackBerry, jammed up, photoshopped a few different phone parts together, rushed back to Verizon, and showed them what would, in a terrifyingly short turnaround time, become the BlackBerry Storm. Yeah, the one without Wi-Fi, and with the entire display mounted as a single, giant, physical button. Where Google spun on a dime and adapted their modern Android operating system to more iPhone-like implementations, and Palm and even Microsoft eventually abandoned their legacy operating systems, just left them to 
fizzle out fast while they rebuilt newer, more modern systems, BlackBerry stuck to their Java OS and just tried to stretch it out and adapt it as best they could. Since not everyone could or would switch from Verizon to AT&T just to get the iPhone, there was a real business to be had for whatever not iPhone Verizon was willing to put its massive weight behind at any given time. Be it the Storm, the Droid, eventually what became the Galaxy line. So the Storm actually sold well, too well. With no way to live up to the hype and problems from design to execution, it soured many of BlackBerry's staunchest supporters and sent them running to AT&T and the iPhone or to Android phones on Verizon. BlackBerry had apparently codenamed the Storm AK, the Apple killer, but it turned out to be less than a band-aid for BlackBerry and the bleeding was just getting worse. Apple had Mac and iPod money. Microsoft had Windows and Office money. Google had AdSense. Samsung, well, Samsung basically had nation state level funding. Whether any of their phones were successful or not, went up or down, or would take time to take off, those companies could absorb any losses in a way single business, effectively phone only companies like Blackberry or Palm or even Nokia simply could not. What's more, the iPhone was developed in secret for years. It certainly wasn't fully formed when Steve Jobs dropped it on the world. It didn't even have the App Store yet, MMS, copy paste, but it had what really mattered, an interface and experience that made it so compelling, that made everyone who had one eager to show it off, to evangelize it, and everyone who didn't and saw it eager to get one so they could show it off. But nobody outside Apple, hell, most people inside Apple, never saw the struggles, the thousands of failures that were overcome before the iPhone was ever able to ship. The moment Steve Jobs showed the iPhone off though, every other company suddenly had to compete and contend with it, with that image from that announcement. And very much in public, every reaction, every step, every misstep, all under a giant, glaring spotlight. We got to see a bunch of former Apple and iPhone team members, the ones who believed in physical keyboards and WebKit based interfaces and frameworks, go to Palm and birth WebOS. We got to see fresh blood at Microsoft eschew the rich textures and photorealism Steve Jobs took from Pixar to make the iPhone more appealing and relatable to the masses and create the digital authenticity of Windows Phone. And we got to see BlackBerry realize J2ME wouldn't take them any further and so buy the real-time QNX operating system and start work on what would become BB10. At the time, QNX was being used to run things that absolutely, positively could not fail. Nuclear power plants, submarines, the computer systems in cars. Its whole purpose wasn't to be fast or responsive, but to be utterly predictable. It was a perfect machine, but one without anything in the way of a human interface. Apple wasn't standing still either. Microsoft decided to sacrifice Windows Mobile exclusivity and license Exchange and ActiveSync to Apple. Apple decided to sacrifice the goodwill of its carrier partners by announcing iMessage and cutting deeply into SMS and MMS revenues, supposedly the most lucrative legal businesses ever devised by humans, with iCloud to just sync it all. And a year earlier, Steve Jobs had taken to the stage once again and introduced the iPad for it all to just sync with. Now, BlackBerry had dabbled with the idea of a big screen companion device for its phones, but after seeing the iPad, scrambled to turn that companion screen into a full-blown tablet, and what's more, use it to debut what would be its QNX system, to test it so the phones could keep flowing until it was all well and cooked. To help build out the interface, BlackBerry bought the Astonishing Tribe, pixel and experience wizards of their time, but then showed up in suits and ties and minimized and micromanaged every ounce of wizardry out of Tat's designs. Apple had a single developer platform, so BlackBerry decided it needed as many as it could. Apple wouldn't allow Flash on the iPad, so BlackBerry decided it simply had to have that too. Apple had a full screen interface, so BlackBerry decided it had to use a WebOS style cards based interface. Everything that the 20% of vocal internet pro users complained was missing from the iPad, BlackBerry embraced, not considering that the lack of those things was exactly what made the iPad so appealing to the other 80% the mainstream. It was a critical mistake common to almost every other competing tablet of the time, which is why there are so few tablets left now to compete. 
Worse, shipping was proving so difficult that BlackBerry ended up neglecting its only successful product, its phones, just to get the tablet out the door. The tablet that was meant to show Apple that amateur hour was over, that it was all pro-level business from that point on, that BlackBerry somehow then ended up naming the playbook. And there would be no playbook too. The QNX-based BlackBerry 10 eventually made it onto phones, though it was never backported to the tablet. But it was too late. The playbook didn't just burn out, it burned the phone business out as well. Instead of niching down at what it was best known for, what its customers loved most about it, what truly differentiated it in the market, BlackBerry decided to ship that first BB10 phone without a physical keyboard. And the traditional BlackBerry phones, which the company kept making, took a turn towards the bazaar with the passport shape like a passport. It wasn't a square, but it also wasn't the slimmer rectangle every other phone design had settled on. Some tech pundits, the ones perpetually bored by iterative iPhone designs, applauded and encouraged BlackBerry for doing something different. Of course, few if any of them actually intended to buy one or to help BlackBerry cover what listening to the internet instead of their core market cost them. QNX's founder and CEO and their vice president of software left for Apple, as did a lot of BlackBerry's best and brightest. Eventually, BlackBerry Messenger ended up being worth more than BlackBerry's phone businesses, but the company resisted making it multi-platform. Now, there's this story about Steve Jobs when his trusted lieutenants came to him and said, if they wanted the iPod to really succeed, they had to put iTunes on Windows. And Jobs said no, but they said Apple had to do it. And Jobs, trusting the people he hired, warned them what the consequences would be if they got it wrong, but then let them do it anyway. If not for that, there wouldn't have been the iPod success we know now, and there may not ever have been an iPhone, at least not like we have one now. BlackBerry chose not to make the same choice, the choice Microsoft had made with Exchange and ActiveSync years before. BlackBerry chose to keep BBM exclusive to BlackBerry. Right up until WhatsApp systematically copied every single one of its features, took them all cross-platform, and ended up selling to Facebook for $19 billion. Then, only then, did BlackBerry take BBM cross-platform. Of course, because BlackBerry had never imagined a world where people would have more than one device, BBM pins were never designed to support multiple logins, and all manner of the most ironic workarounds imaginable couldn't really fix that, not in time. But it didn't matter, it was already too late. The world had moved on. Very few countries have phone businesses. Even fewer have operating systems. With BlackBerry, Canada had a phone business and two operating systems, BBOS and QNX, including BB10. But with another new CEO, and not one from the product world, but the services and enterprise world, both those things would change. BlackBerry did what a lot of its users had done and switched to Android, trying to tie its services and security model into Google's operating system. And they licensed out the handset brand to TCL, who created a couple of keyboard-based phones with the logo for BlackBerry on them, but never quite the soul of BlackBerry inside. Until this week, at least, when TCL announced the end of its license and its BlackBerry mobile phones. And that's it. That's how BlackBerry ended, because Steve Jobs could see what would end the iPod and decided to do it himself. And BlackBerry couldn't see what would end the BBM pager and so were ended themselves instead. If I could, I'd animate it all up for you, but that's where Kyrgyzok and Skillshare come in. If you've seen The Egg, legit one of the best YouTube videos of the last year, then you've seen them in action. And with Skillshare and Motion Graphics Part 1, you can see how they do it. Seriously, so many cartoon birds died to bring you those videos. So many. Skillshare is an online learning community that offers membership with meaning, with classes to explore in illustration, design, photography, video, freelancing, and more, real projects to create, and the support of fellow creatives. Skillshare empowers you to accomplish real growth, all designed to move your creative journey forward without putting your life on hold. You can learn and grow with short classes that fit your busy routine, and affordably, with an annual subscription that's less than $10 a month. Join more than 7 million creators learning with Skillshare. The first 500 of you that click in the description below will get two free months of premium membership so you can explore your creativity. Act now and start learning today. Thanks Skillshare and thanks to all of you for supporting the show. So hit like if you do, subscribe if you haven't already, it really helps out the channel and disrupt that bell gizmo. It's the only way YouTube will actually tell you when new videos go live. Then hit up the comments and let me know. Did you use Blackberry in the day? And what are you using now? Thanks for watching. See you next video.